the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. Yeah, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to another episode of our new podcast, What the Hell is Going On? So today we're talking about what the hell is going on in North Korea. And Danny, there's a lot of crazy news coming out of Pyongyang this week. So the most sensation, which we don't know if it's true or not, but it turns out that Kim Jong-un is a big fan of James Bond movies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> according to several British newspapers, uh, that he's imitating the movie You Only Live Twice. If you remember that movie, there's the evil villain who executes some of his operatives who failed him in killing Bond by putting him into a piranha-filled tank. This organization does not tolerate failure. I know, but do you see... I... Go. <laughs> Kill Bond. Now. Yes, number one. Yes. Yeah, it was it was number one, and it was yeah. number five or number twelve who failed him. I can't <laughs> quite remember who it was, but yes, I and do remember that scene. They did drop him into a piranha-filled tank. Well, several British newspapers are reporting that Kim Jong Un has actually built a piranha-filled tank in his presidential palace in Pyongyang and executed one of his generals by throwing him into the tank. It's unbelievable. This is the same guy who executed somebody else who fell out of favor with him by lining him up against a wall and hitting him with a rocket-propelled grenade. Yep. I believe that's a that's at least it's a quick way to go. It's, it's quite remarkable that uh, if, if it's true, one, we don't know if it's true, but the fact that we even would consider the possibility that it's true, it just says a lot about North Korea. And, uh, and two, that this guy actually sees himself as a Bond villain. <laughs> Well, but hang on a second, Mark. He sees himself as a Bond villain, but you saw what the president said in reaction to that story, right? No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. No, the president really downplayed it. Mm -hmm. The president indicated that he was not that disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> by by executing people in a piranha-filled tank. Well, we don't know if that's true, uh, but it's really interesting to talk about. But what apparently may be true is that the head of the uh, special envoy to the United States, the head of his negotiating team, Kim was so upset with their performance in Vietnam and his failure to get a deal that he actually has, was executed by firing squad and that other members of the negotiating team have been sent to re-education camp. That's, that's pretty uh, striking. And then we also have the other news is that his half-brother, who we know is dead. Um, <laughs> right, because he was assassinated in, what was it, an airport in Malaysia? Malaysia. Right. He was assassinated by two women who thought that they were doing a YouTube prank and actually were, were executing Kim Jong-un's half-brother, who had fallen out of favor as well. Exactly. Well, apparently he was in Malaysia to meet with a CIA operative, according to these press accounts, and that he was actually informing on the regime. Uh, so there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in Pyongyang uh, in addition to the nuclear standoff. So if there was ever, ever a good occasion to ask, what the hell is going on? <laughs> it is, in fact, the opportunity presented to us, not just by what is going on in North Korea, but what is going on between the United States and North Korea, what's happening. And we really have no better person than AEI's own expert, Nick Eberstadt. Nick is the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at AEI with Mark and me. He researches all sorts of issues, but among them is really one of the most authoritative people on the question of what is happening in North Korea. He wrote a book called The End of North Korea, and he's a founding board member of the U.S. Committee on Human Rights in North Korea, which actually had a really good event recently, Nick. Did you not? Yeah, the one on the abductions from Japan and around the world, and Americans abducted to North Korea. It's a systematized kidnapping for their purposes of state and for their intelligence operations training. I mean, we laugh about all of this and compare it to James Bond. But of course, you know, James Bond is how you say fiction. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you think is happening inside the regime and, and, and whether, you know, these stories are actually credible. Well, ab about the uh, dogs eating uh, disfavored cadres and ak, ak guns and that sort of stuff. I mean, it's a vicious criminal regime. Uh, it's like a vicious Leninist mafia operation that has diplomatic immunity. So when you hear stories like that, you can't just say, oh, no, that couldn't happen. The qualification on this 
I'd say, is that this dictatorship is different from Mao and it's different from Stalin in a way that has actually allowed it to survive and develop. It's a Leninist dictatorship that's also a hereditary Asiatic dynasty. And this has turned out to mean that they're very happy to have hundreds of thousands of their own subjects die or to have millions of people abroad die for their own purposes of state. But if you're in the court at the very top, your life is very precious. It means that when people are disfavored for screwing up a negotiation with the Americans, for example, they're not likely to be fed to the fish because they may be useful later on. They may be sent to a prison camp they may be tortured. They will certainly be punished and humiliated. But if you're in the elite, you're much safer than you would have been if you were in Mao's elite or Stalin's elite because they'll come back and want to use you later. Kim Jong-un has changed the rules of the royal court in a way that must be terrifying if you were a part of that criminal collective. He killed his uncle. He killed his half-brother. Up until his tour of duty, the royals had always been perfectly safe in North Korea. By changing those rules, he presumably believes that he's consolidating his power and gathering influence through rule of terror. But it must also at the same time be giving everybody a reason to want to have their own plan B if things go south. So walk us through this. If there is, in fact, a purge happening right now in the wake of this uh, failed negotiation in Vietnam, what's happening to these people? If, let's, let's assume for a second that a group of these people are being put into the okay. prison system and being interrogated. Walk us through okay. how this works in North Korea. Well, this group, which I'm proud to be associated with, the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, has, I think, written the most interesting and alarming and detailed descriptions of what the prison system looks like in North Korea. Actually, a lot of the work from this research group went into the UN's report and the Commission of Inquiry a few years ago. There are two different types of prison camps in North Korea. One is a re-education camp and one is a camp for political criminals. Your life expectancy is pretty short if you go into the camp for political prisoners because uh, as a political criminal, your value is maybe what you can produce through hard labor, but you're worth less than zero. The the control system in North Korea is very attuned to Asian family values. It's not just the infractor. It's not just the person who's being punished who goes into the camp. It's their entire family out to the level of their cousins or to their grandparents. If you want to know why there are so few defectors from North Korea, look at that. If you defect, you're risking the extermination of your entire family line. So all of this said, the most important thing to know if you're going into a prison camp in North Korea is this. What is your songbun? Songbun is the word of life course in North Korea. It's your political status. You're assigned political class, which is assigned to you when you're 16 years old. There are about 50 different political classes assigned to people in North Korea. Generally speaking, there are people at the top in the core group. There are people in the middle called the wavering classes. There are people at the bottom called the hostile classes, like if you're a descendant of a Christian or of a landowner or something. You're you're in very well if you're the descendant of a revolutionary martyr who was a pal of Kim Il-sung's who founded the states. Your survival expectation in the prison system depends entirely on your songbun, on your class background. If you're from one of the disfavored classes, kiss it goodbye. But if you are a negotiator for the dear respected leader, you're going to get, I wouldn't say a vacation trip, but you're very likely going to come out of this alive and maybe a little bit chastened and frightened and sent back to work a whole lot better than before you had the fun experience. So, I mean, this is important for people to understand because I think when a lot of our colleagues and mates think about other countries, whether North Korea or you know any other, Iran, Russia, an adversary, and even some of our allies, we basically think these are countries a lot like hours that imbibe the same information that we do and just kind of make different judgments. They have different values or they have their different communities or it's just a different, the, you know, the really popular line. It's a different culture. And of course, 
the answer is that what you're describing is that Kim Jong-un has created, even more successfully perhaps than the Soviet Union, has created a different reality. You know, the sun and the moon don't rise in the same way. It's almost impossible for a non-psychotic American to understand what this system works like and what the basis of thinking is there. And I don't want to reveal too much about myself in this. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time looking at this stuff. So, so you know, when Steve Began, who was a colleague of Marx and, and mine at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, got the job as the special envoy for North Korea in the Trump administration, one of the books that I recommended to him, and I've been beating him over the head to read, is this The Orphan Master's yes, Son yeah, sure. book, which, by the way, I strongly recommend to anybody and everybody who's listening to this. Mommy, that means you. It won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction a few years ago. And and the author is not an expert in any way on North Korea. But I still remember one scene where our hero, the protagonist, is lying on the deck of a boat and he's got some listening equipment where he's meant to be monitoring either the Americans or the South Koreans on behalf of his country, North Korea. And he hears some interference and Americans talking and he can't understand where it came from. Anyway, long story short, it turns out that it's a satellite that happened to pass over at the moment when his antenna was directionally placed the right way, and he can't understand what it is because these kinds of things don't exist in that world, and they can't exist in that world because North Korea is so scientifically superior to everywhere else. And understanding how this gets figured out is sort of that parallel universe that you were talking about. But we tend to think of North Korea as a communist state, and maybe as a first approximation, that's okay. It was a satellite established by Stalin on the Soviet Union's eastern frontier as opposed to all of the Warsaw Pact states which are on the western frontier. But unlike the Warsaw Pact states, North Korea broke loose. It shook loose and it became independent and it got its own legs and spent the next decades playing off China against Russia for aid from both and allegiance to neither. And while they were doing that, they came up with a whole new raison d'etre for themselves, which is not about Marx and not about Engels. It's a form of national socialism is a term that's already been dibsed, so we won't use that. But it's racial socialism. It is about the future of the Korean Minjok ethnicity race and the role of the North Korean Workers Party run by the Kim family in Pyongyang of leading the oppressed Korean race into their place in history. This seems to have a lot of legs because unlike the the other Soviet experiments, this one is still here. But it's impossible for an American who goes through a regular liberal arts education to get their mind into this way of thinking without some really serious adjustments. So let's assume that a purge is taking place of some kind in Pyongyang. What does that mean about how Kim sees these negotiations as having gone? He's obviously upset that he didn't get a deal in Vietnam, and he's lashing out and, and purging the people who are responsible for for that failure. Isn't that a sign that he really wants or needs a deal, that he's under pressure to have this diplomacy with Trump succeed? Well, there's always a purge going on in North Korea. <laughs> so, I mean, that's yeah. that's part of what keeps the system going is that everybody who uh, is beneath the supreme ruler has to live with some sort of fear of performance. But this they, is sp- specific to the, yes, to the negotiations. Yes. After the Hanoi summit, a couple of really unusual things happened if we want to play like inside baseball. Kim Jong-un brought a big cadre of propagandists to Vietnam because we assume this was supposed to be the the filming of the great triumph over the Americans. Now, the U.S. team may or may not have been aware that they agreed to a summit that was going to conclude right before the 100th anniversary of the Korean Peninsula independence uprising against the Japanese uh, imperialists, you know, March 1, uh, 1919. I would think this was supposed to be choreographed as his great triumph over the imperialists, but of course that didn't happen. And for the next 
several days in the North Korean propaganda and their press. They were basically tap dancing. They were trying to figure out what to say. All they could say is, oh, it was a very nice meeting. Oh, we met with the Americans. It was very nice. They had not at all expected that they were going to be coming back from Hanoi empty-handed. So then Kim Yong-chol apparently takes a state-paid vacation for a little while. This is the, this is the, the chief negotiator. Chief negotiator. Who's either dead or in a labor well, camp or... Been, either he or a body double was just seen <laughs> sitting a few yards away from Kim Jong-un at a cultural event. Mm-hmm. Now, you may say that having to sit through a North Korean cultural event would be punishment enough, but... <laughs> Torture. But somebody somebody did seem to – somebody who did look like him seemed to be alive there. And after this happened, you see these kind of funny little hints coming out which may suggest how the North Korean leadership is trying to deal with their failure to close what they saw as the deal with the guy that they called the dotard. Okay, So there are shorter range missiles being tested. There are little – not huge threats but little threats coming out in the North Korean in press. It seems, if I were to interpret this, that they're flummoxed because up until the Hanoi summit, the North Korean negotiators had more or less, in their view, run circles around the Americans for a generation. And to give them you know, their due, they've got the nuclear weapons to prove that they're the better negotiating team over this long period of time. But then when they were supposed to close the deal in Hanoi, they did not get what they wanted to. And now they're in a box. If they threaten too hard, if they start trying to push President Trump around, the United States and the international community can squeeze harder the international sanctions that are already suffocating the North Korean economy. And if they don't denuclearize, they're in a race against time. The North Korean economy is really dysfunctional and really dependent on outside resources. Can I ask, can I interrupt you for a sec on that? Because I really wanted to, actually, this is one of the things that people don't know and don't understand yeah. that you really have shined a light into. You wrote a great piece last year for commentary on the North Korean economy. Yeah. You said they're being strangled. Apparently, they've been doing, prior to, to this round yes. of sanctions, they've been doing really well, right? So this is actually a reversion to the previous norm that is kind of problematic for Kim Jong-un. So when we talk about North Korean economic performance, we know we are you know, using a low bar for this. The, the latest Kim, Kim the third, Kim Jong-un, has had a very different approach to economics from his dad. His dad saw the collapse of the Soviet Union and concluded that any bows or movement towards pragmatic reform would lead towards the sorts of of disaster in his eyes that he saw in Moscow and the Eastern European socialist states. No reform, no opening, no pragmatism, thank you. His son took over this ruined economy that his dad, you know, bequeathed him and has repaired the state apparatus and repaired the functioning of the economy much better than I would have expected. And largely he's done that by allowing what his dad would have called the poison in, the cultural and ideological poison. And he seems to to have concluded that the regime could handle that much better than his father thought. It's very small, but it's allowed for more commercial activity and more pragmatic commerce in the North. And the North Korean state, like the mafia, takes a big bite out of that. And on the basis of the profits from that little commercial sector, they've been financing the race towards a nuclear arsenal and the race towards uh, missiles that can hit Washington, D.C. And that's, I think, part of the reason why there was this big speed up in the testing of weapons up until uh, up until last year. But you're saying that since then, since you wrote this article and did this analysis, that the sanctions that have been in place have beaten that back? It looks as if this is the case. We have about the same number of uh, sources of economic information about North Korea that we had about Louis XIV's France, except that the Sun King wasn't practicing strategic deception against us. We're dealing with appearances here. In stylized terms, it looks like the sanctions are squeezing North Korea's economic resources from abroad, and it's very dependent upon those. It's like a siege of a fortress. What I assume is happening is that the financial reserves and the strategic war reserves, including like energy and food, 
are being spent down. I can't prove to you that's the case because there's some things that are happening which are odd. The exchange rate is still stable. The price of food is still stable. Of course, if you were besieged, you would want to be walking around on the parapet saying, wow, I just had a great meal, you know, yeah. so to, to discourage the people who were trying to squeeze you. But this can't go on forever. And I think part of Kim Jong-un's agitation at the summit with President Trump in Hanoi was trying to get all of the sanctions off in time. Mm -hmm. And so they're in a box diplomatically and politically, as you pointed out. They're in a box economically because of the sanctions and the ramping up of the sanctions. So far, so good. There's a catch. There's, okay. a, there's, so a big, the catch? there's a big nuclear and ballistic catch. At the beginning of 2018, Kim Jong-un established the diplomatic space for making nice with the South and making nice for us because he said, we've tested our nukes. We've tested our hydrogen bombs. We've tested our long-range ballistic missiles. We're satisfied with them. We're right now moving into mass production. While all of this diplomatic activity is occurring in fitful ways, the North Korean defense economy is building an arsenal of nuclear weapons and long-range ballistic missiles. And when the North Korean government is satisfied that it's reached its target, it's going to move the nuclear crisis to the next level. Mm -hmm. They think about this stuff a lot. So how does that play out in your mind? Two questions. First, how does it play out? But also, uh, I would say, okay, is there anything other than um, uh, removal of the Kim regime that is going to solve the problem? For almost 30 years, we've had diplomats who've wanted to probe North Korea's nuclear intentions. I think we've done that pretty well. The North Korean regime wants to be a great nuclear power because it's not just its survival path, it's also its only plausible path to gathering all of the Korean people under its authority. Remember, it's like racial socialism. They view South Korea as their territory. There's no way that the North Korean government can give up its nuclear quest and also claim authority over the South. And giving up authority over the South if you read this doctrine they've got, it would have to be like really close to treason. So I don't have a good enough imagination to figure out how they agree voluntarily to give this stuff up. So did Kim misread Donald Trump? Because if you look at every past negotiation, Kim probably expected to follow his father's playbook, which is they blow up some cooling towers, we lift sanctions, they continue building their nuclear program and then surprise us later on. Well, that's what and happened in the Clinton administration. Exactly. That's what happened in the Bush administration. Yes. And it didn't happen in the Obama administration just because we were busy letting Iran do that instead. But I mean, Trump has taken a different approach, both here uh, with North Korea and with Iran. So we pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal specifically over the complaint that all the sanctions relief was front loaded and that the denuclearization wasn't robust enough, verifiable enough, and what, and what came later. And so he seems to have taken a very hard line, which is that I, I'm willing to sit down and talk with you and have summits with you and treat you like a world leader and give you respect, but I'm not giving you anything until you actually denuclearize. So he hasn't lifted sanctions, hasn't unfrozen assets, hasn't ended the Korean War hasn't given them diplomatic recognition. He canceled some exercises, which is debatable whether how big a concession that is. But he's basically not playing by the Kim Jong-il playbook. And that seems to have Kim Jong-un flummoxed. I, I would have said that the Singapore summit, which took place almost a year ago, was not American diplomacy's finest moment with the DPRK. The joint statement that came out of that read to me as if it could have been written by the North Korean foreign ministry. We used North Korea. Korean formulations about things like the nuclear problem. The North Koreans always talk about denuclearization of the Korean peninsula, meaning U.S. with your nukes leave South Korea so we can take them over. That whole episode may have raised Kim Jong-un's hopes that he could play the guy that he had earlier called the dotard. It turned out that at Hanoi, he was in for a very rude surprise. I mean, why, why do, what do you think? that I still haven't gotten a good idea explanation well, because I actually think that Donald Trump was ready to give away the store. I don't know, of course, what's happened, and I'm not that good a Kremlinologist about my own country. <laughs> but my impression is that our side may have been willing, as per usual, to agree to a bad deal for us. And the North Korean side wanted us to accept a very, very, very bad deal for us. And we weren't willing to go the extra step. Tell us what is the state – I mean you talked a little bit about how they're building all these weapons. What's the state of the threat that they pose to the American homeland now? They have not been able to test a missile that can reach us, reliably at least, right? Reliably. Uh, it can be the case. when is this breakout going to happen and can we live in a world where North Korea can reach the United States with a nuclear weapon? 
Well, it's always important and sometimes even informative to listen to what the other side says. So the North Korean side right now is saying, we will give the Americans until the end of the year to come to an agreement, a settlement with us, the North Korean regime. That is either an idle astrological argument, or else it has something to do with a timetable of two years being the amount of time that the North Korean regime estimated it would need to move towards the next phase of nuclear and missile readiness. Since I have no security clearances and I'm not a military guy to begin with, I can't tell you how to evaluate that. But I wouldn't have thought that they would have just made up a number like that without having thought through what they're going to do after that. How would North Korea's behavior change if it had nuclear weapons that could reach the United States? Why does it want those weapons? Is there a purpose other than regime security looking at Libya and saying, I don't want to end up like that, and so the, the only way we're safe, or, or Ukraine that gave up its nuclear weapons and saying, I don't want to end up like these countries, I just want this for regime security, or they want these weapons for an offensive purpose? Well, it's, it's, it's like the old joke about business or pleasure, right? So... Um, <laughs> You want to be able to point a pistol at Uncle Sam's head if you hope that Uncle Sam will release the rest of your captive people from his imperialist clutches. And arranging for the crisis at the time and place of Pyongyang's choosing in which to have a nuclear showdown with the United States is something that must be permanently at top consideration for North Korean leadership. The Korean War, the 1950 invasion of the South, was not an accident and a mistake. It was the beginning of a game plan and a vision that all three generations of Kims have had. It's just that now finishing Grandpa's vision is a little bit more complicated than it seemed back then. I mean, this is our habit in the United States. We are too ready to deny agency to our adversaries. We're too unwilling to to believe, you know, Iran when they threatened to burn. They're too, we're too unwilling to believe the Saddam Husseins of this world when they say that they want to achieve, you know, weapons of mass destruction. We're too unwilling to believe the North Koreans when they say that they're going to target a major American city and, you know, burn it in fire. I, I can't understand what percentage there is for any American president not to take that seriously. From our side, I just wish that we would give 1% as much thought to what our countermeasures should be against North Korea as the North Korean leadership gives to thinking about what their plan for dealing with uh, the United States is. They take us very seriously. I wish we would give them the courtesy of taking them a little more seriously. You say that there are two civil wars in the Korean Peninsula. Tell, tell me about that and how does the civil war within South Korea affect these negotiations? Oh, that's a very, very interesting question, Mark. So, of course, the obvious civil war is north and south. It's the unsettled, still unfinished war between the two Korean states that began in 1950 and is only uh, under armistice right now, no peace treaty. The other civil war is within the Republic of Korea, within our ally, South Korea, where you see a society which is, if possible, even more polarized than America today. And the fault lines are between people who were radicals in sympathy with the communist revolutionaries on the one hand, and people on the other hand who were, they'd be called collaborators with the uh, Japanese imperial authorities and later collaborators with the U.S. government. The nearest template I think we can get is kind of like Ireland, where everybody knows whose ancestors were collaborating with the bastard Cromwell, mm -hmm. <laughs> even, though, even though it happened in the 1600s. All those wounds are very fresh and very raw. And that civil war between the two different factions in South Korea still finds itself in politics. It's expressed in politics, although not in ways that outside observers will always uh, understand. The current progressive government is very much on one side of that divide, whereas the imprisoned princess, uh, former disgraced former president Park 
is very much on the other side. What is the sunshine policy and why does this undermine our efforts to, to get North Korea to denuclearize? If it's just spelled out on a blackboard, it wouldn't seem that this should be subversive of the U.S. alliance with South Korea. The idea of trying to reach out to an adversary and to uh, get them to see reason through dialogue, nothing sounds wrong about that. The difficulty in the way that so-called sunshine policy has been executed under three different presidencies in South Korea is that in practice, the sunshine exponents see themselves as the mediators between the government that is dedicated to destroying them and their ally that's committed to protecting them. And it is subversive of support in South Korea for the alliance, which has allowed for South Korea to become a free and open and very, very prosperous society. It insinuates and suggests to its supporters and to others that the United States is the reason that there hasn't been a conciliation between North and South. In a way, that's true. If we hadn't been there, they'd have been run over and put in prison camps and it'd be all one very happy family. But that's not the way that they mean it. And and what we've seen, and one of our colleagues, Olivia Schieber, had a really good piece um, in Real Clear Politics about this just a couple weeks ago. And what we see is that the South Koreans, when they go for this sunshine policy, they go for it with North Korean enthusiasm. Um, they are editing out references to the North Korean invasion of the South. Yes, in the textbooks. In, in, in school textbooks, they are denying funding to dissidents for whom they've always provided funding, not to, by the way, subvert the North, but even to talk about their experience that they had trying to escape from, from North Korea. It's like whitewashing. It, it is. I mean, un- unfortunately, that's exactly right. That's what they're doing. And so you have this pendulum that also swings every time the government changes. Right. But that puts the United States in an invidious position. And by the way, we have not even bothered to mention the fact that we've got like 30,000 troops there between North and South Korea. And actually, we do have kind of a stake in, you know, how how this all sorts out, not just between North Korea and the United States as a nuclear threat that can reach Washington or Los Angeles. Well, you know, Los Angeles, whatever. But uh, <laughs> but that we have these guys in harm's way. We have allies in Japan. We have, Absolutely. you know, allies in the neighborhood that are really threatened. So it's unbelievably subversive, I think. Yeah, it is. And it's so horribly ironic that the self-styled advocates of of human rights, the champions of freedom and people power who are in charge of the South Korean government should be like the three see no evil monkeys when it comes to the worst human rights nightmare on the planet, which is the catastrophe that's being visited on Kim Jong-un's subjects. This is also part of the contradiction. When the progressives in South Korea hear people criticizing North Korea, they immediately want to talk, so to speak, about the lynchings in the South. It's, It's like anti-anti-communism was back in the old days of the Cold War in the United mm-hmm. States. So let's get let's end up by end the, end the podcast by getting down to some brass tacks. Can North Korea's nuclear drive be stopped diplomatically? And is Trump right to try? He's certainly right to try. It's certainly true that the only possible way of stopping it diplomatically would be by top-level talks between the dictator of North Korea and outsiders. Can it actually happen? My imagination is not big enough to see that. We have the existence proof of the glorious idiot Mikhail Gorbachev, Mm -hmm. who stumbled his way into unraveling his empire. But the North Koreans have seen that. Mm -hmm. Assuming that these talks do not succeed, and that North Korea is on the verge of declaring itself a a nuclear power and having a demonstrable capability to strike the United States but has not done so. Can we let that happen? Can we deter North Korea the way we deterred the Soviet Union for years? Or is this a threat that we cannot allow to manifest itself? We have a lot more room for squeezing and pressuring North Korea for economic suffocation of the state, international genuine human rights campaigns, delegitimization of North Korea's international diplomatic presence. There are a lot of other things that we can do before we have to think the unthinkable. Actually, before I let you close, I want to ask actually that that one key question because you're right. There's a ton of room between where you know where we are now and where we could be in terms of squeezing 
squeezing the North Koreans. But one of the things that has been almost a truism of all of our negotiations over the last 20 years with the North Koreans has been, oh, the Chinese will Mm. never let that happen. You know, I've got to say, the Chinese seem almost a non-factor. And, by the way, they have let that happen. It was, you know, the Chinese will never allow the North Koreans to become a nuclear power. And they have. Are we fooling ourselves about the Chinese role there? Yeah, I think we're always fooling ourselves about the Chinese role. We're always looking for kind of like deus ex machina from China or from saying that the Chinese government won't allow our policy to succeed. China's got a lot less influence in this than we imagine. And we can also, let me say, bring the Chinese leadership to Jesus if we want to. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's absolutely true. You know, this is, I mean, look, this is something Mark and I are going to talk about a little bit, but this is what we do with the Iranians. This is what we do with everybody. We pretend that we understand what the dramatis personae are in this play much better than the players themselves understand it. There are pragmatists in Iran. No, no, no. In Russia, Medvedev is really a better power. No, and, and, and the reality is our record our batting average is about zero on this stuff. But Danny, what, I, what I'm saying is it's not going to be easy or pleasant to get the Chinese government to come to Jesus on North Korea. It'd be very unpleasant and there'd be a lot of second and third order consequences. But if we believe that the North Korean nuclear threat is an existential threat, then we're obliged to use our considerable power to compel the Chinese government to behave a little better. Well, from if your mouth a, to God's ears. If this is an existential threat and we, everything else has failed, is there a military option? Is that, or is that just so unthinkable to, uh, that it can never be contemplated? A preemptive American military action would surely be catastrophic in a lot of its consequences in the Korean Peninsula. It would surely mean the end of the U.S. ROK alliance. It would surely put the United States in a very, very different place forever afterwards uh, in international diplomacy and our role. It's something which would have to be considered with the utmost caution and only considered seriously if it were a matter of American national survival. It's an extraordinarily dire thing to think about, and there are many, many, many steps before we get there. I hope we never have to think about that. Nick, thank you very much for joining us. Well, per usual, we started with James Bond and fun, and we got down to serious brass tacks. Mark and I seem incapable of not nerding out, and if there's anybody to nerd out with perfectly, it's you, Nick. So thank you really for joining us. It was fun. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, one of the things that was interesting to me in this discussion, uh, Mark, was (laughs) – Mark Mark knows what that means when I meaningfully state your name – You seem to intimate that Donald Trump was doing a pretty good job with this negotiation. Nick smacked that back a bit by saying that the Singapore, you know, the Singapore Declaration that was the first iteration of the North Korea talks really was basically nothing more than a massive capitulation to the North Koreans, Mm -hmm. which is what set the stage for them thinking there was going to be even more capitulation in Vietnam. Do you really think they were so great? Well, first of all, in I I think in Vietnam, he was very much like Reagan at Reykjavik. He walked away, uh, which I think was a was a. I feel like he got dragged away. Well, (laughs) regardless of how it happened, he, he. they didn't cut a bad deal. And so here's here's the way I look at it. There's a reason why for decades presidents of both parties have been kicking this can down the road because it's a really – as Nick explained to us, it's a really intractable problem. Sort of military action, it's very hard to stop the nuclear drive if the other side is not willing to do that. So – I give Trump a lot of latitude to try something different because everything else has failed and also because on his watch, we've run out of road. He can't kick the can down the road anymore because the North Koreans are this close to becoming a declared nuclear power. This close. Uh, (laughs) And so so I give him a lot of latitude. And the reality is, is if you look at what he's done, he's engaged in personal diplomacy. He's elevated Kim stature-wise with with these summits and with the nice things he's saying and buttering them up. But he hasn't given him anything. If he's tightened the sanctions, he has not recognized the North Korea diplomatically. He has not ended the Korean War. He's not unfrozen assets. He's not given Kim any of these things that he's asking for. And if you look at it in the context also of Iran, we pulled out of the of the Iran nuclear deal that Obama had done for a set of specific reasons, because the sanctions were front loaded, because there was no verification, because there was no requirement to end the enrichment of uranium, but just to stop it. All these flaws in the deal, they set themselves a bar yeah, by which that they have to meet. Uh-uh, hang on. You're still too nice. I'm sorry. 
know, you, you know, you're always too nice. And I don't want to sound like Nancy Pelosi, even though I've recently been saying nice things about Nancy Pelosi. Oh, my gosh. I know. My meds are off. But uh, um, no, but seriously, you know, Trump stood up at a press conference with the Japanese prime minister and he downplayed the launch of North Korean missiles in the direction of Japan when all that the Japanese, who are, you know, actually our allies, yeah. wanted was for him to be concerned about this. He doesn't draw the line in the right place on elevating Kim. I understand what the strategy is, and I've, I've excused it to a certain extent when he's done it with Putin and he's done it with Erdogan, because I recognize that he, that's one of his negotiating tactics. But I know you, want to, you want to interrupt me. You guys can't even see this, but Mark is like, uh, he's like <laughs> chopping at the bit. But but what we have told the Iranians is that we have set out, Mike Pompeo set out 12 conditions yeah. that the Iranians need to meet. Those 12 conditions added up mean that the current regime is not in power anymore in Iran. Okay. Now, I'm down with that. No problem. But the North Koreans have to be reading those as well. Just as we are sort of stupid about them, they are not stupid about us. That's where I think your, your analogy falls down. Well, I, first of all, I don't actually have a problem with what Trump did in, in Japan with the, with the short-range missiles. Yeah. No, with the, with yeah, in the press yeah. conference with Abe yeah. about the short-range missiles because he's trying – he is using a strategy of – Engaging the North Korean leader, not giving them an excuse to bust out of the uh, bust out of the uh, the current moratorium on testing that they've that they that they've agreed to, and keep the negotiations going. And so I don't, you know, him beating up on uh, what would other than feeling good, what would him beating up on Kim and causing a crisis over short range missiles? Because they Advance. take this encouragement, because no, they take, because I, the North Koreans believe that that's a, that's a pass for them, yeah, that they I can do those sorts of I, things. You got I, 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 that is my biggest problem with him. I just don't think I I think the line should have been drawn there. I think he ought to have been a and lot. And so, what clearer. should we go back to now uh, to what we were doing with uh, with fire and fury because they did, they launched some short range missiles? Look, what's happening in North, what what I think they recognize what's happening in North Korea is they went to Vietnam, as Nick explained to us, and they expected to get a deal and they didn't get it, and so now. They're frustrated and flummoxed in the in, in Pyongyang, and so they're and so they're lashing out. I'm it gonna, was a limited action. It was a limited action with the, with the short range missiles. They didn't launch long range missiles. They didn't launch anything that could reach Guam like they were going to. And so we're, we're smart to sit back and let them flounder a little bit. They're having purges. I am going to bring a recording of this. For well, the it's... next meeting between the president and Kim Jong Un, and there will be another meeting between sure. them, and he's gonna he's gonna screw his supporters who believe that he's got the right strategy. I think I, know, and I, I think you're, President you're, Trump is gonna first of all, you, Mark. first of all, I I, I I defy you to put this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a podcast, Andy. This is not us talking in your office, and you're not recording it for our and putting it in your drawer. And two, I don't think that the strategy is going to work. I, I so you don't think there'll be another summit? No, I think there might be another summit. I don't think they're going to get a deal because I don't think the North Koreans are are really to, ready to make the decision to denuclearize. But but everything else we've tried has failed. And so I give him some latitude to give this a try and see if it works because the alternative, as we saw with Nick, as Nick told us, is the, is almost unthinkable, which is we have to take military action or live with a nuclear North Korea that has broken out and had a democracy. Not that we don't live with plenty of other nuclear states, whether it's Iran well on the way or it's Pakistan or it's others. Well, OK, we've got, we've, got a, we've got to wrap up. I think I want to just underscore that I have learned an extremely important management lesson in this entire discussion, mm -hmm. and that is that the big part of my missing leadership at AEI is that I don't have a piranha pool. <laughs> And I just want you to think about that next time you disagree I, I think, with me, Mark. I think many people here today, I think you have a virtual piranha pool. <laughs> well, we'll leave, we'll leave that for our listeners to contemplate. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for having us. Our editor is Gage Hurley of Liquid Media. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening.